Hello, this is the uh, Seeds of Liberty podcast with um, Dave, Dave the Heel, Jeremy, and uh, Danilo from Peaceful Anarchism. We're going to dive right in uh, to some topics we were talking about in the last episode uh, that we kind of mentioned at the end, um, right? Net neutrality, public schools, um, and maybe even, uh, you know, uh, you were saying, what, um, what's it like to be on fire <laughs> when you become a voluntarist, right? Oh yeah, that's. I think that's going to be the main chunk of discussion uh, for this podcast episode. So, um, so yeah, so so um, I guess we'll start off with um, I don't know, maybe public schools to start off with. Um, so, so let me just say, my kids, um, yeah, I have a four and a half year old, two and a half year old, and um, and you know, basically, I'm a, you know homeschooler, I'm unschooler, closer to unschooler, and uh, and it's uh, you know, so far it's kind of. It's kind of tame, you know, not really um, doing it hardcore, I guess, because uh, I can, I can, I can usually give the excuse that uh, you know he's not old enough to go to school, so uh, people just like stop asking questions. But, <laughs> but most of the time, I like to engage people, you know, in um, talking about their kids and school, and you know, you know, I ask people, you know, did you enjoy your school, you know, your school years, right? And and if, if most of the people are honest, right, they say well, no. <laughs> so how can you? How can you possibly force your kid to go through the same experience if you had a horrible time, right? Which sounds a little bit sadistic to me, right? <laughs> so, um, do, do you get this? Do you get this um, this experience too, Jeremy? Um, well, I haven't actually had to deal with it yet, but I, I will be in the uh, very near future. I have three and a half year old twins who we plan on homes slash unschooling. <laughs> Uh, just to, to whatever extent uh, it ends up working out. Uh, but I definitely don't want to deal with the uh, public schools because, as you said, I, I know what I, I, I know how I felt going through them, and I don't want to put my daughters through the same thing. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sure once, you know, like I said, they're only three and a half now. So once they get up to the age, I'm, I'm sure, sure that's going to be a big argument. <laughs> I, well, no, like actually, both both my parents were at well my mom's retiring at the end of this year and my dad retired a, a few years back but they were both educators and they both understand why we're going to be doing this uh, oh really so, so they're on board that's cool yes yeah because well my mom's actually getting out now she was going to stay in a few more years but she's finally retiring because the common core just pushed her over the edge and she wow. just doesn't she doesn't want to teach it so i don't i don't blame her <laughs> <laughs> hey, pretty much any standardized <clears throat> curriculum is an appeal to authority. That's all it teaches. Yeah, exactly. And also the, uh, I guess you can say the, the the broken window fallacy in that you know you're forced to you're forced to spend this amount of time, pretty much fifteen thousand hours of your youth, right, the most impressionable years of your life, learning stuff that you don't you're not interested in and is not valuable and not relevant to your life. <laughs> So you can you can essentially say that's a waste of time. That's the definition of being a waste of time, right? Yes, that's yeah, absolutely. It, it would be considered a waste of time. <laughs> yeah, and and if and if if you know the state can force people, you know, to forfeit a portion of their income, they can force people to go to a, a, a you know a quote education institution when they're young. You know, they can they can force people to do all these things. Is that you know is that not considered? Um, slavery-like, right? Uh, maybe not 100% slavery, but it, it's 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 a percentage of being enslaved, right? And and I think that that's 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 what uh, what my, is when we say statism is slavery, right? My ma my main issue with public schooling is the knee-jerk response you get when you tell the average person <clears throat> there shouldn't be public schools. Their their immediate response is well. Um, what do you just want a bunch of stupid people walking around? Like the, we want smarter people so we have a better society. And I asked them in their definition or in their experience, what is the greatest thing that the government has accomplished to an extent better than what uh, the, f the free market has? And uh, of course that question absolutely just blows their mind because there's not a, an answer for it because the government has never done anything like create a microprocessor that uh, is getting closer to the intelligence of a human. Like, the state will never do that because, like we've stated before, the state 
has to try to set up a racket and maintain that racket. And innovation would only prove that that racket doesn't need to exist or it would, uh, you know, innovation would reduce the influence of that racket. So when you have a public school and you ask someone, well, why should I be robbed if I don't have any kids, or even if I do have kids and I don't want them to go to that public school, why should I be robbed to pay for other people, you know, uh, other people's kids? Does that make me a bad person that I, I don't want to be robbed? I will lose my house if I don't pay my property taxes. That's how schools are funded, um, unless they are belly up and the federal government bails them out with our tax money anyway. So we, <laughs> we're, get, we're getting taxed anyways to pay for these schools. Um, the biggest the biggest thing is, is could you imagine, like, just, I know this is a scary thought, but could you imagine if Google was in control of teaching kids with no government-enforced curriculum, like, how, how much smarter in five years kids would be? Mm-hmm. Like, and I'm not saying that Google is smart and that they didn't obtain their size through the force of government. <clears throat> what I'm saying is, is that they have some of the smartest people on planet Earth working at Google. And if those people hired with all the money that they've collected intelligent other intelligent people to de- design curriculum, it would outpace any government school. And you would have a group of idiots in society. Those people would be called government school attendees. And sorry to go on a long rant about it, but that's <laughs> I, I really, really hate the school system. And my, my aunt is a nurse. Uh, or uh, uh, is it my, my? I do have an aunt that is a nurse, but my aunt is a school teacher, and me and her have went bound and bound about this. And I, and I just say that public schools are used to prop up teacher unions who almost always vote Democrats, um, or or they almost always vote for one political party that runs that union. And uh, we're all robbed to pay for those teacher salaries, and the salaries go to the union. The union money goes to the politicians. So essentially, the the politicians are writing their own check at that point, and she sees the problem, but she doesn't see how to get out. You know, a lot of people see the the cell, but they don't <clears> see <throat> where the keyhole is. You know, I talk a lot with my um, my mother, my sister. My sister is actually working uh, in the public school. She's a uh, speech language pathologist, and uh, you know, my mother. You know, I don't know if I said on the show last time, but she's a uh, Democrat, and she's actually admitted to be. A, a socialist, which uh, she considers to be a compliment, or <laughs> but in our circles, it's an insult, right? <laughs> um, but um, it means that you believe <laughs> that you don't own yourself. Yeah, yeah. Among other things, I mean, um, I mean, it's it's really it's really amazing how you know people have uh, they've associated government with um, their own identities, right? And that, I think that's not a coincidence, you know, like. Um, you know, just the phrase Uncle Sam, like, what? He's my family? He's my uncle? <laughs> you know, they, they, they want you to feel cozy with government. They want you to feel like, you know, they're looking out for us, right? And also, I think it's, um, it's an interesting coincidence that people who emerge from government schools are um, – uh, often in favor of government, right? Like, is like, don't they see like, w- is that a coincidence? <laughs> like, how many people emerge from government schools that are that are you know free thinkers and like, you know, actively trying to uh, undermine? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, oh, it's, yeah. it's not a common. It's not a common <laughs> no, no. Thing. You're 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 right. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a ninety nine to one ratio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 if you know, it's all, it's all about like you said the. Uh, the appeal to authority, logical fallacy, you know, it's like, you know, might, might equals right and, you know, they don't encourage um, peer-to-peer problem solving, right? It's always, you know, appeal, you know, seek, the, seek out the authority, you know, you have no freedom of speech, no freedom of association. Um, <laughs> and uh, and in, in many ways, it's quite indistinguishable from prison. <laughs> not, least yeah. of, not least of the fact that they use the same transportation buses for prison inmates that they do with children. <laughs> oh, and they'll throw your guardians in prison if they don't get a special waiver to not take you to this prison. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yeah. You, I mean, even you, well, even down, even under the way they design them with the drab colors and the you know the concrete, uh, the wall, <laughs> and and the and the disgusting tile. It's uh, yeah. It's, it's meant to demoralize um, and not actually educate. You know, we make the joke all the time. Well, it's not really a joke, but we, we you know, we call it indoctrination um, because that's that's really what it is, and it's it's teaching conformity. 
it's a uh, it's it's a one size fits all. You know, I was saying before about my mom, who is finally getting out after thirty plus years as a teacher, at elementary school, and she just couldn't take it anymore. And you know, even she sees what what's going on. Um, and she, she doesn't agree with uh, the rest of the things I believe in, but at least I have her on this one. Uh, but it's not, you know, it's not just with the common core. I mean, that's just the that's just the latest. Uh, what, it's it's, it's, it's what really no different now. than what they've been doing for years. Well, no, it's just it's more. Well, not now the government, regardless of what they say, because I was before I, I was in, in that battle right before I finally gave up on the system altogether and and accepted uh, anarchism and and volunteerism. Uh, it was uh, I, I was I was still with the Tea Party and, and helping people out with that. So I, I and all the defenses about how it wasn't really a real thing. In the end, of course, it is because that's where the money the, that's where the money's going to and coming back out from, and that's where. So, so yeah, to that extent, it's just a little more centralized than it used to be. But ever since the Prussian system was was introduced in this country, what 125, 150 years ago, uh, that was that was the downfall of education ever since then because it, it teaches it teaches the kids to conform. And not to be free thinkers, like you were saying, Danilo, before about how they don't leave. You know how many leave. Um, and, you know, I, I think your um, estimate might even be a little uh, 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 low there, Dave. Um, I think it might be even higher than that uh, percentage-wise of how many free thinkers actually come out. Thankfully, these days it, it seems to be more. At least uh, if you judge social media and the, the the people I've come in contact with over the past couple of years, there seems to be a lot more younger and younger people that are starting to get this. Uh, which uh, I'm both thankful and jealous of at the same time because I wish I had had the, that foresight uh, back then. But um, yeah, it's it's always it's, it's always been bad. Uh, I, I I railed against it most of the time I was in it, uh, even though I got good grades because um, I was able to memorize the stuff and I never did, I never did much. I did the minimum amount of homework. I always crammed for test that before and always got ace. Because that's all you really have to do is it's it's memorization and it's you know giving you mindless work to do um, to make you to make you feel educated, but you're not actually learning anything, which is why the whole homeschool and unschooling movement uh, has such has, has such a greater potential for churning out free thinkers and having people that question everything and and, and leading to a more a, a definitely more educated. I would, I would say that homeschooling has the possibility of doing that, but homeschooling in the wrong hands could make an even worse case for a an appeal to authority. You know, the the but I will concede a point that uh, the quicker people realize that public schooling only serves to keep pumping out people to serve the fascist state. That's all it's for. Um, the 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 quicker I think it will see its demise. So I think <clears throat> what we have to do as liberty a activists, or, or I hate the word activists, but liberty minded individuals, is tell at least one person, um, why do we get robbed to pay for schools? Like, would a market for higher learning not exist? Um, without a uh, state forced monopoly, or it's not a monopoly, but a state forced, uh, you know, uh, sector of it. So, well, it, it is a monopoly in the sense where even if you homeschool, you have to abide by certain government uh, curriculum re regulations. So, yeah, depending on the most states are like that. Yeah, I know, I know that it's like that here in New York. That there's a bunch of hoops I'm gonna have to supposedly have to jump through. <laughs> so that means you need to get out of New York, right? Escape from New York, Kurt, Kurt Russell style. Believe me, I, uh, I, I it's it's high on the priority list. <laughs> that, New York has to be the shining, like the shining example of a fascist state, right? Uh, like I, yeah. I, I think they're probably worse than uh, Weimar Republic right now. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> what, like, unless you're Jewish, of course. But well, Cal California is bad too, but to, to different to different extents. They both have you know California is a little more free with the marijuana and stuff like like that, and. Uh, but uh, over over here, it's. Uh, I mean, I don't live in the city. It's worse in the city, but over over here, it overall, it's it's pretty bad. 
They, uh, they, they, any law they can pass, they will. <laughs> I mean, there's just so many people out there that believe that they know what exactly is the best for you, your offspring, and your family. And I think that idea is so wrong. And I, I, I don't really understand how anyone has that. And, and I used to hold those things like, oh, we need, you know, conservatively ran school systems. And <laughs> I'm, now that I'm thinking about that, that's completely idiotic. It would never work. Because it's a liberal construct uh, on the status paradigm. It's a liberal construct, so any attempt at it is going to always end up in liberalism or uh, uh, liberal, uh, uh, more socialist leaning uh, fascist supporters. So. I'm actually amazed. Well, I don't, I, I'm actually amazed that um, Detroit um, went bankrupt and like you know had like its little economic collapse because it's not the most indebted city in the United States, right? Like I think um I think Los Angeles and Manhattan, Chicago, like Austin. are even yeah, are in even more debt than New than Detroit. Yet Detroit was the one that collapsed, right? Well um, because because Detroit ran out of its tax cows. Yeah, they, yeah, they started fleeing. When the, when the auto industry got destroyed, everybody yeah. left. And uh, most people that were, you know, they, they first they moved out to the suburbs and then they even left, you know, then they moved even farther out than that. Yeah. So that's that's why they didn't have they didn't have the tax base to pull from anymore. Uh, New York and you know, New York especially uh, is, is still no matter how bad they are in debt, people will still move there. The prices will still go up and idiots will still pay for it. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I haven't seen the numbers lately, but I can't imagine that the population has decreased all that dramatically, <laughs> mm -hmm. even with all the, all, all the de complaining about the Blasio and what he's been doing since he's been here. Um, let, but, let, uh, let, me, let me, let me ask you guys something. I, I got into a conversation with my mother-in-law recently about, um, you know, about, you know, evil landlords that are exploiting their tenants by, you know, um, <laughs> that are like, uh, you know, and it's, and it's like these people, they make so much money and they're just exploiting the tenants, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, they're only making these enormous, you know, uh, luxurious high rise, you know, apartment complexes to, to cater to the ultra rich. And, you know, what about the little guy, you know, he's getting robbed by this evil landlord. <laughs> How would you guys respond to that? Um, well, I, for one, would first say that, unfortunately, that person is extremely ignorant of economics, which is usually the problem in most situations. It's, uh, they're angry at the wrong people. Uh, are, are there slumlords out there? Absolutely. Are there people that will take advantage of these, these type of situations? Absolutely. But it, that's not the overall cause. The cause is government being in the way in the first place, whether it be, you know, federal, local, state, um, whatever the uh with with the regulations that they put up and and the uh, of course the the hidden inflation tax which affects everything and everybody at all times uh prices continue to go up and up and up and certain people that would be willing to <clears throat> build shorter uh, small uh, rather cheaper cheaper apartments cheaper places to live uh, stuff like that, so people didn't have to spend as much money are forced out of the market altogether, just like they are forced out of every market because the because of the regulations and and the cronyism that goes on, and that's that's why that's why these people have to pay this you know price. But like I was saying before, especially in the city, the idiots will keep coming and keep paying the prices anyway. So why would they stop? They're just they're the people the people that are making all this money and the evil landlords on the whole, are just taking advantage of what's been given to them. They're just using the system the way it's designed to be, which is cronyism across the board. And that's how that's how the rich, that is how the rich get richer and the rest of us stay the same or get worse on a daily basis. Well, my response to that uh, question, Danilo, is to ask the person to explain this scenario. Okay. Rich guy somehow finds a reason to buy up a bunch of land and build a bunch of high-rise apartments on it. All right? Uber rich guy, billionaire, T Donald Trump. Donald Trump somehow buys uh, an island and puts a – and there's 10,000 people on this island, all natives, and they agree to sell the island to him. He uh, builds up a bunch of high-rises and says, look, if you can't pay to live here, you're out. All right? 
what's going to happen to his investment that he put into that if no one can afford to live there? Mm. <laughs> oh, he's going to – that's going to go belly up. He's going to have to go bankrupt. Yeah, he's he's going to lose all that property for not being able to upkeep it or defend it or even be worth defending. And it's going to get retaken over, right? So if we have you know, the, the whole – in New York, that's the big thing. Oh, they're buying up areas, they're gentrifying it, and they're pushing minorities out because the minorities can't afford to live there, right? At what point do they run out of enough people to pay that extra high rent and have to either subsidize the living through government handouts because that's what happens, or does that person go bankrupt and have to cut back on his losses and charge lesser rent so therefore those people move back in? It's the supply and demand that, that somehow communists do not realize exist regardless of what economic system <clears throat> is being enforced. Even in, even in the strictest, most absolute, 100% to the book communist state, supply and de demand still reigns supreme, which enforces a bit of capitalism. So you have this situation where they... It's not a broken window fallacy, but it's a lack of economic intelligence situation, like you said, Danilo. And my biggest thing to them is it just explain to me how supply and demand works for everything else except for this scenario or this boogeyman that you're, you're coming up with. And a lot of people I, – I try to help them make them realize that their point is completely off base. And, and that, that's really my only – point to the whole thing is like show me where the, the principles of supply and demand do not dominate the situation like if you have a billion house or a billion apartments for rent but no one can afford to live there you're going to lower the prices so people can move in to maximize your profits because you have to make an ROI or else you'll go bankrupt people think of this evil capitalist landlord <laughs> who owns all this land and then just can sit on the money in the land and not make a, <laughs> a profit off of it no one's going to do that Donald Trump doesn't build a hotel and charge exorbitant prices to not make a profit. Mm -hmm. If there was no profit to be made, he wouldn't have put the hotel there. <clears throat> so that's really all I have to say. It's such a clear-cut example, you know, of, you know, okay, so you want Big Brother to fix this by rent controlling. So therefore you're saying that that person who's renting you out a uh, place to live doesn't own that property outright. You know, it was like I was telling you guys the other day. I was talking to a guy who uh, said – I asked him, can you own land in the United States? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, well, can you make crack in your house that's on this land? And he said, well, no. And I said, well, then do you really own that land? And he sat there for a second and was like, <laughs> no, I don't. I said, so the government owns that land or because people believe that this fictional entity owns that land, it happens like that. So – the same argument happens for anyone wanting the government to force landowners, landlords to subsidize rent control and give them government handouts. It's a fascist – like you said, it's a corporatist relationship to hand out huge welfare payments to these landlords to keep certain minority or certain statistics you want for an area. Uh, let me let me just preface that for a minute. What, what, what about my mother-in-law? She comes from communist Romania, right? So she grew up in communism. <laughs> so you can understand the level of economic ignorance that she has. And she came over here, and um, and of course, you know, the first thing she's like, you know, she's like, there was no unemployment in my in my country, right? And um, which is which is a completely idiotic argument, right? Like like full employment is the goal, you know, it's, if full employment is the goal, then let's just, you know, throw away all the machines and dig ditches with, with teaspoons. <laughs> we'll, we'll all be employed, right? We'll, we'll all starve and so, and be impoverished. So, so, you know, and, and then she also says like, you know, living should be free. Why should I have to pay a price to live? <laughs> and I tell her, I'm like, I'm like, okay, so the guy who, or, or the company that brought you electricity from that light bulb right there, see, he paid you know, millions of dollars to bring electricity and to bring to bring water through your faucet, and then the the food that you bought. How much money was 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 invested and spent to to grow that food and transport it? <laughs> so 
they they should pay for that, but you shouldn't pay to get it. <laughs> they should be enslaved to appease you. Yeah. It's her argument, well, basically. Yeah, of course. Well, they, yeah, but that's that, that's exactly you know you, you, when you first started off explaining about it, that, and I said the same thing before. It's, it's economic ignorance, and and you were hit you were hitting on that before, Dave, about how it's not they don't. They just they don't understand. They don't get it. They just don't understand because it's, it hasn't been explained to them, or if it ha- it's because it's been purposely, pur- purposely been withheld for them, and they just know they know who to get angry. They know who to get angry at based on who they're told to get angry at. Oh, and yeah, they're they not propagized to be propagandized to be angry at, at at who the government wants to distract them with. Well, yeah, of course, because it's it's a matter of the there. As I said earlier, there's. There's, there are there there are the really bad actors and there are the ones that are trying to take advantage of that and they are and those are those are the, those people are the focus and everybody else gets associated with them and they get lumped into one big thing and that's what they but the average person gets told okay they're the evil guys they're the ones you want to go after they you know you can't you, you can't uh, no, nothing get get it done because they're so greedy. And they want, you know, they just want what's theirs and they're going to, you know, that's why people think, oh, it's, it's so expensive to live. Well, yeah, because you need, you need to work for that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you were saying about the, the subsidies, Dave, about how that, that's what, that's how, that's how the system propagates itself because the, the really rich ones, the, the soup, the, the, the super bad actors are the ones that get the most benefits from the government and they force everybody else out of the market. And so they are able to charge whatever they want. And if they do come to the point where they charge too much and people start moving out, where in the free market they would collapse, well, they would have to lower their prices or the store would collapse. They get propped up even more. So they're able to continue to keep charge. Even they'll lower the prices a little bit, uh, just enough to get people to come in with the subsidies. And as soon as everything levels off again, they'll start increasing the prices ever so slowly again, and the whole cycle will continue. Will will, prep, will continue itself. So it's. Uh, I just thought of something. You know, any any communists that and and I equate statist to communist with the same thing. <laughs> but any communist that believes that a landlord is evil for charging a certain amount of rent, I just want them to look back and, and think about their holy leaders, and and I just want the, them to realize. That their governments are who issue building permits, rent licensing, uh, all this other stuff that is included to actually have people uh, able to rent from you. Um, so their governments are the ones allowing this to happen to them, um, and then they want government to fix it. You know, like I, like we always harp on government. Government's job is to make problems that only they can solve. And building housing in an area that the market doesn't demand and then overcharging for it is a problem that only government can fix. Temporarily. It, it, yeah, temporarily because it, it runs out of money. But you get what I'm saying. Like it ha- it's, not designed to, it's not designed to fix it. It's no, no. Designed, it's, it's designed to give you the, give the illusion of it being fixed. It's the Band-Aid, the Band-Aid over the cancer, right? What it is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Band-Aid. The, the the doctor the oncologist saying well we cut out ninety percent of the tumor good luck <laughs> but uh you know that sorry to interrupt you Jeremy that just popped in my head and I was thinking you know anybody that's mad at something and wants the government to change it more than likely the government's the reason why it's like that because you get artificial demands through government you get art you know the, the Walgreens story I told you guys again you know about the liquor like that's how do, a giant company is made from one government regulation. So this huge multi-billion dollar pharmacy mo- uh, conglomerate was cr- c- created through government. So <clears throat> yeah. the problems that people have, you know, oh, I'm such anti-big, you know, those people, are, I'm anti-big business. Show me one big business that hasn't used government to achieve that status of big business. Like, do you honestly think Walmart would be as big as it as it was if it didn't get special tax rates in towns? If it didn't uh, get s- special waivers to not have to, you know, treat their employees correctly and all all this other stuff 
that are enforced through government. To, to pick up off what you were just saying, but that, of course, that's where that's the monopolies and that's the evil monopolies we're supposed to be afraid of are created by the entity that everybody runs to to stop the monopolies from getting to us. And the vicious cycle continues. Um, it's not, yeah, like, you know, it, it really is. They're, they're not, people are, that, like I said, you know, I keep saying it, but it's true. People, they're wrong at the, they're mad at the wrong people. They need, um, they, people run to government because they, that's all they've known. You know, Danilo, you said it last week and it's a common theme. Most of the problems go back to, a, to an appeal to antiquity. That's all they can, that's all they can think of. So that's all they, that's all they know to question that they don't, they don't question it. They just, that's all they know to run to. So there's a problem. Government's got to fix it. You know, I, I said something like that, uh, last week about how the, 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 the ought to be a law crowd, um, <laughs> is just, I, those people drive me nuts. Anytime somebody says there ought to be a law, uh, my first thought about them is that they are lazy and cowardly at the same time because they want government to use its power and force and basically point a gun at somebody else and tell them what to do. They uh, enforce their morals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's, it's with that with every interaction. But, but again, people don't think about that because they try to, they try to, it never enters their head. Well, cause they try to compartmentalize how, you know, you know, I think you were saying that before about how it's, they, they don't understand that, you know, or no, Dave, you were saying that about how, Somehow it's different <laughs> with 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 the with the uh, real estate system. Well, you know, somehow every the economic supplies everywhere else except there. <laughs> they just they don't get it because they compartmentalize. They see that as different. Oh no, that it's not the case. It's it's just the evil landlord. Well, it, like you know, you both of you guys have been saying, how do you get these evil landlords? You, you're given special favors by the government. You're given money by the government. Uh, well, which, building permits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's that's. Even the honest ones that aren't the the the, the majority of, of landlords that aren't the you know great evil people that 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 most the average person in, in, uh, has the image of in their head when they're thinking of the evil landlords, uh, you know that's the that's the minority of them. The majority are hardworking people that are just trying to make you know trying to make a living and running they, a business. They, they, yeah, exactly, that's what they're doing. They're running a business. And they, they may have been a little more successful than the next guy, but they just, people just assume the worst of them. Um, but they have to jump through all these hoops with the with like you were saying with the building permits and everything else, and 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 uh, keeping up with every regulation where the regulations across the board increase every year by like the thousands. I think uh, it's ridiculous, especially because it's not just government putting them down. Most regulations that come out every year come from the departments that have been created um, <laughs> unconstitutionally, uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> not that I really care about that thing anymore, but it's, it's true. Uh, most of these agencies, they write their own regulations, and they're not. They're monitored by themselves, and they're overseen by other entities in the government. <laughs> to propagate uh, itself. Uh, so, but all of this costs money, and that's that's where a lot of the rent comes in and, and we tie that to the, to, to the constant inflation tax and taxes in general that continue to go up every year because the government just keeps in every, at, in every, at, at every level continues to expand everywhere constantly and uh, just costs more money and budgets have to increase and they keep spending more money, which causes the prices to rise and people, you know, the, the ones that aren't getting the protection, those are the ones that end up having to sell off their property. Those are the ones that lose out uh, because they're not getting the special favors and the favorable regulations that are written for the for the big wigs uh, can only help the little guy for so long. And eventually those uh, even those uh, edge, you know, edges wear, uh, wear off and uh, they're left with with having to lower their prices to the point where they're losing money and. And then they end up having to sell off, usually to one of the bigger people who sweeps, who swipes, who swoops in and picks up the pieces uh, and just adds to their ever-growing empire. And uh, it's just, but people don't want to see that. They want to think Jeremy, of Jeremy. I have a simple, I have a simple solution to that whole problem that you just said. 
raise taxes, pass another law. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Dave, uh, you said before about artificial demand. Let, let me let me propose an, an argument. I don't know if you guys heard this one. It's kind of interesting. Is this a devil advocate? <laughs> no, it, it was. Yeah, it let was, me let it, me roll these sleeves. It, up. It, it was an, it was an argument that. Um, was proposed with the guy that I did my debate with, uh, one of my, you know, one of my debate videos. He was saying uh, he's talking about NASA, and he was saying that that government is there to create an artificial demand for something that would not necessarily exist. He's like, so, so, you know, it wasn't profitable to go into space. Like, who wanted to go to the moon? Nobody wanted to go to the moon, right? So that's why we need the government to make a program. To go to the moon. Now we went to the moon. Isn't that wonderful? We we would have never got to the moon. <laughs> right. No, 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 no. So we would have gotten to the moon if there was if the moon had gold on it. <laughs> but there's jack shit on the moon, except for its gravitational pull on our Earth. That's its only use to us right now, seen right now. Supposing we've actually been there. And I'm not one of those guys. And, and but actually, I, and actually, I was going to say, are we going to are we, are we gonna have to change courses on this conversation? No, 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 no. So, so, so refine your question for me so I can thoroughly squash it. Well, well, okay. So he said, you know, create an artificial demand like NASA. And then also he's like, you know, what's the market demand for like tanks and helicopters, you know, Apache helicopters and stealth bombers? There's no market demand for them. They're just there for destruction, right? So we have to, you know, create a military to create an artificial demand to uh, you know, um, <laughs> create these, you know, these machines of destruction, right? Or else they would never have existed. Isn't it wonderful that we have Did a government you... that created an artificial demand? <laughs> okay, so let's just take tanks for instance. All right, I don't want to talk about moon landing because whenever you bring up something like that, the minute cognitive distance dissonance sets in, the status is going to say, "Well, think of all the byproducts that uh, occurred because of the moon landing." You know, we have a satellite, Hubble telescope, blah, 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 blah. All that's byproducts, but you can't say that, you know, killing a guy that was going to kill the savior of the world, you know, create uh, the doctor that was going to cure cancer, you know, that's, oh, yeah, well, killing that guy was good. Like, that's not a, the consequences don't equal the action, regardless of the outcome. All right. So you can't say that all this boondoggled money that was spent, and if you haven't looked up the word boondoggle, it is the most perfect word to use for government. Yeah. That is the <laughs> that is the ultimate explanation of government. Boondoggle. Google it. B O O N D O N G I boondoggle. <laughs> boondoggle. <laughs> boondoggle. Government is a boondoggle. Everything they do is a boondoggle to propagate themselves. But the artificial demand thing, let's just take tanks, all right? Why are tanks built, all right? Why are they built? The simple question is, is to secure a protection racket. That's it. That is the simplest answer. When you cut out all the semantics, whatever else, they are to secure a and defend or to increase the size of a protection, a geographical protection racket. All right? Mm -hmm. That is their only use. There's only one entity in the world that does that. Government. So there's your artificial demand. That's the only demand for tanks, which are completely outdated. Like, I, I said to someone the other day that in 20 years, which will probably solve a state, there, there won't be troops, there won't be this, there won't be that. There'll be hackers, and there'll be guys running drones. Because if you can't blow it up with a drone or shut it down, shut down the power to it and all that, you're not going to beat it. So <laughs> that it's that simple. And, you know, I you know one drone pilot is going to it's going to completely destroy the socialist communist foundation that is the army. It's one drone pilot is going to replace ten thousand soldiers. You get yeah, what I'm saying? Well, theoretically, yeah, but I don't. But no, I, the state's not going to allow that to happen because well, we're going to need, gonna, yeah, gonna okay. need those ten thousand soldiers to protect that one drone pilot in his little capsule that he was running the drone. So yeah. obviously, they're going to need soldiers to protect assets. But you get what well, I'm saying? 
It's not even a well. I don't even think I was. I wasn't going to go in that direction. I wasn't even going to say to protect the assets. It's it's to you know to 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 play off what you were saying. It's to continue the boondoggle because they need you know even if even if you could and even even if they could get these drones to be you know the the line that's always given that with a surgical precision. Um, even if that was a reality and they could limit the the. Uh, what should we call it? The collateral damage. Uh, brain fart there for a second. Um, even if they could limit the, the collateral damage, and they could have is a brain fart. <laughs> <laughs> they could have these precision strikes, and the people that still believe the government would clamor for these these situations instead of sending troops in and saying, "Oh, we could reduce it all to this." All to this point, yeah, as you said, Dave, government's not going to let that happen because in order to perpetuate the system. As I said last week, it's a fear-based system. It has to. It, they have to have that fear. And how do you have that fear? You have the military be always always be on the ready and and keep increasing and almost never de decreasing in strength and size, and always keep creating boogeymen uh, to keep the people afraid and keep the keep the people thinking necessary. Men. Exactly, because if they didn't, if they don't, if that fear isn't there, more people will be become not just anti-war because there are anti-war states. Um, even, even though there are already anti-war activists, even that aren't uh, voluntarists, that aren't you know people on our, our side of the fence, uh, but they, they're just anti-war itself. They still believe a military is necessary and all, and, and all this stuff, and and they're still willing to pay into it, and and so they're not. They're not all the way over yet, um, but there because enough people still believe that it's it's necessary for protection. So you'll you'll never get you'll never get rid of that as long as government wants to perpetuate it, and they're going to want to continue to perpetuate it because that's where the bulk of their money ends up going, whether it's directly through the budget or the the perks that come out to the big companies that that pay for everything, um, and that that filters down to all the all to the, all to the big wigs on the other side. Um, and that's why, you know, that's what I was going to say. It's not, you know, that's why I'm glad you clarified yourself because I, I thought you were going to say that they're, they'll, they'll get rid of the troops and they never can. Cause, and, and at some point, well, they've you know, eliminated, um, 500,000 troops in the last, uh, two years. Uh, and a lot of those were higher ranking. Um, I believe I, I I could pull it up and and post it on the website uh, when when I get a shot. But uh, before Danilo has to respond to us, I just wanted to say it's B O O N D O G G L E <laughs> and it's Boondoggle. And the definition apply this to government. The definition it is so perfect. It's a noun. It's work or activity that is. Wasteful or pointless, but gives the appearance of having value. Nice. That is government in a nutshell. In a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Like, government equal boondoggle. There's no other one. That's the, I'm making that shirt. I'm making that shirt. I'm so, making it. So, so the way I look at that argument, what, what he proposed, you know, artificial demand, right? We need the government to make, to make things that are not profitable, right? And then... And I, I said to him, um, that's to me, that's the um, Bastiat seen and the unseen, right? So what what we see that government has quote produced is NASA, is you know public education, is you know whatever they did, um, but we don't see the potential that was destroyed because of all the force that was applied in making those things come about, right, through coercion and violence, right? That's what we see, right? But we don't see the potential. And that's why it's so difficult for people to, to imagine, you know, um, <laughs> uh, a life without government because, you know, you see how our lives are now and people could not possibly imagine any other life if, you know, without being in a parallel universe, right? So, so it's one of the most difficult things to have an imagination, right? And, and maybe coincidentally, that's why, you know, public schools beat out <laughs> creativity and imagination. <laughs> to uh, not be able yeah, to they imagine. do. So, so, so yeah, I was, I was, you know, that's one thing. And then, and then the other thing is, if something is not profitable, why should it be made? <laughs> that was my, like, you know, just, 
the right. idea of, of profit and, and, you know, the demand of uh, making something that the people actually want to voluntarily buy, that, that is what increases the, the standard of living, right, and the wealth of society, right? You know, when, right. when, a, when an entrepreneur makes something that is voluntarily bought and it increases the standard of living of the people around him, right? And it makes those people wealthier and, it, and it, you know, provides jobs to people who come and work for him. And that's beautiful. Like, why would you want to force people... Which is basically, you know, I, I guess you could say that's basically anything government, like Obamacare. You know, Obama's so proud that he's he's got like I don't know so many people that have signed up for Obamacare. <laughs> but if you don't, you get a penalty. But he's proud that people signed up. <laughs> all these people, all these people signed up because they didn't have a choice. <laughs> but that's besides the point. <laughs> I, I don't understand how people can't see that as clear fascism. I used to love it when I would, I would sometimes turn on. Oh God, we're going to go on an Obamacare tangent. Just listen, <laughs> I, I I don't want to. We can we can talk Obamacare and, but it's fascism, flat out fascism. All it did did was force everyone to either buy corporate insurance or get on state ran insurance, both of which propagate the state, mm -hmm. <laughs> and both of which are actually corporate. But, but, but that's just that, that's just a coincidence, Dave. That's I don't just know a coincidence. What to do with my hands. <laughs> it's just a coincidence. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, Obama's the he's the communist. Blah, blah 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 blah. No, he's a fascist. Every president that has ever existed is a fascist. It pisses me off to no end. Everyone wants to point this gun at communism. Communism is communism is re retardation. I don't care if you hate that word, and. <laughs> Fascism is its evil tool, so it just drives me nuts. But let's get to our main point for this episode. <laughs> the main point. <laughs> yes, we 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 have done two topics. I'm sure there's segues in there. Uh -huh. But let's get to our main point, which is how to channel the energy that you obtain from accepting the principles of liberty, and I think. We can go around and speak that once we first heard, once we first really jumped in the pool, not stuck our toe in, but jumped completely in the pool for liberty, for freedom, for actual freedom, not uh, 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 Uncle Sam freedom, but uh, <laughs> real, true, I own myself freedom. I think all of us probably went through an early phase, and this is the, the core of this, this episode is going to be on that early phase of how to handle yourself when sharing the principles of liberty. And I just, you know, want Jeremy to speak on what, you know, some of maybe some of the uh, mistakes he made early in, in his transition and then Danello. And then I, I'll, 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 I will share some examples and then we can, ref we can, we can go from there. But uh, so Jeremy, what were the, some of the, Major things. Looking back now, it's like, oh, it's so dumb. What were some of those things that you, you know, like go a little bit? I know we covered it last episode, but go a little bit through like that early period of transition where you were minarchist, and like the next week you were you were full on voluntarist, and how you treated people. Um, yeah, I, I, I started to, to talk about this a little bit last week. You're right. Um, for me, at the beginning and. Uh, I'll also say that the, the, the reason we were talk the reason we wanted to talk about this is because talking amongst ourselves um, and with a few other people, uh, we've noticed. I you know I noticed as well. Like, I noticed the trend with the new the, the newer comers, the newcomers to the to the you know movement or movement as I like to call it. Um, they uh, the, that fire that's there, and, and you just want to shake everybody, and you want to tell them, and you and you don't, and, and when they don't get it right away, you don't understand because you finally understand. Um, there's there's a tendency for people to be extremely angry, with good reason, but they're the out, the way they get it out of their system is not exactly appropriate, shall we say? Um, I, I went through that. I went through my own period with that, where where it, it really was that drastic where I started out um, as, as I mentioned last week there was I, I, I went through the the, tip, the the typical six to eight one transition uh, from anarchism to, to anarchism and as I got closer and closer 
the last the last thing for me to let go, which is also a lot of people who were just talking about with the military, that was the, the hardest thing for me to get over. Um, but what I finally did, because for me, it was actually reading Ca- uh, Chaos Theory by uh, Robert Murphy, uh, would put me over Great. the edge with, with understanding. That that was that was my you know you were saying you know you woke up one week one week you were a medicus then the next week you woke up a voluntary. That's pretty much how my overnight transition at the very end happened by reading that that little book. And uh, as 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 soon as I woke up that day and, and realized that you know this was the path I was going to be on, I started reading more and more and more, and I just started blurting it out whenever the opportunity arose, whether it was when I was talking to my friends and family, uh, whether I was on social media, um, even I had to re- really restrain myself with my clients a lot of the times if they would bring certain things up, but I just, it was, it was overkill because I would just, I would beat them over the head with it and I wouldn't, I was telling, I wasn't, I, I was lecturing. I wasn't. You were really, starting fires. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I I wanted, and I was mad when people didn't understand. And and I, you know, I went through the typical phase with a lot of people, like you know, with the name calling and calling everybody sheep, and and saying, oh, you just don't get it, and you're so, and and using uh, even the word status uh, as an insult instead of just what the word it actually the way I use it these days, what it just means. It means somebody who to me it means somebody who believes government government is necessary on some level. But I was hurling it around like an insult and just yelling at everybody and saying, why don't you get this? And I all, and I was so incensed that I wasn't even I wasn't even reading everything that was coming across to me super carefully. So I was falling for more conspiracy theories than I used to and just running with it because I was like, oh, government's horrible. I, I figured out all these things, how horrible government is. And as soon as I heard a story, oh, it's got to be true because of government and they must have done it. Um, and I would just yell because it was actually, unfortunately, right around uh, when Sandy Hook happened. Um, and I almost got really swallowed up in that uh, because all these people that I had just met and, and were espousing all these other ideas that, you know, you know, a voluntary, you know, volunteerism and all this stuff that made sense to me. They were all caught up in things like that. And I almost, I almost got really bad with that and telling every, you know, trying to tell everybody, oh, it's a lie, it's a lie, everything's a lie, it, it never happened. And I, and luckily I caught myself early, early enough and said, well, that I can't be like this. Uh, but I still, I, I alienated a lot of my friends and family uh, just by constantly beating everybody over the head. Uh, I drove my wife nuts. Um, she, uh, <laughs> when I finally calmed down, is when she she got on the the kick. That you know you talked about last week about you know people thinking you're going through a phase. Um, when I fi- when I finally slowed down with the with the rhetoric, uh, that's when she that's when she actually said that to me one day that she thought that I was just ha- I just been going through a phase and she was waiting for it to be over. Um, and I tr- had to explain to her that no, I, I just I, I was a little too overexcited. And now I'm gonna sit back a little bit and 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 as I said last week, not, now I try to ask more questions instead of just telling people because. It's hard not to. You, you get you you get that fire in you, and you get excited, and and you see everything clearly. And like I said last week, uh, I I was I was angry, um, because not only was I angry at what had happened, I was angry that I had allowed it to happen. And the the inward anger was actually worse than the outward anger. And I'm always you know most a little of bit of say, projection. Well, yeah. Well, most people. Well, I was gonna say most people. You know, will we'll use we will we'll use the line. You know, your own, you're, you are your own worst critic. Um, that's the way it's supposed to be, and I take that to heart in the worst <laughs> in the worst times, and and that's what it. You know, for me, that's what it was. I was just angry, and I and I wanted to get that anger out. I wanted to tell everybody, and uh, it's it's not it's it's not the greatest approach. Like, like I said last week, some people. It will work on. I've met I've met people uh, where it actually does. Like they need that slap across the face almost to, to start seeing the, the and making the connections. But on the whole, it, it's a lot easier if you can ease people into it and and get them to come to these uh, realizations on their own. Which is why I now I've I've scaled back a lot. Now I try to ask a lot more questions and. We'll we'll, no. we'll hold hold off on that because we're gonna we're gonna go in into tips about this later. 
Um, but uh, is that is that all about all you had to say on on some of the missteps you had early? Yeah, well, like yeah, like I said, I I came to that I, after I after I people stopped talking to me. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, re I realized that most. Did you have a lot of people quit talking to you, Danilo? <laughs> I can't imagine it with that. I never I never really patch. had many friends. So. <laughs> <laughs> I no. can't imagine it. Just people just wanting to just just maybe get a little twist. <laughs> no, but anyways, go ahead. So. Uh, I think the biggest mistake that I made was voting for Obama, two thousand eight. <laughs> Which obviously I just don't even want to hear you say it again. It's <laughs> Man, two episodes. It two episodes. The, the it. inner Rush Limbaugh in me is killing me. It's I, it's he's he's crying on his knees, going Danilo. I participated in the subjugation of my neighbor uh, unwillingly, and uh, <laughs> you know the road the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So it's very very unfortunate, but um. You know, I find it interesting, uh, you know, all the books that we read. And, you know, most most volunteers, I find, read a lot, you know. Like, like you, don't, you don't really meet too many people that are like, you know, I just, I'm an anarchist, you know, I never really read anything. <laughs> no, there's not too many people like that, you know. Maybe um, now, uh, like with the internet, videos, people, you know, they learn about stuff through videos. But, but a lot of volunteers are well-read, right. And what really amazes me is when, when I talk to somebody and then they just – they just throw out like a like an argument like they think they they won like like you don't think there should be rules <laughs> like, you know like like you know all the things that we read you know we never considered that there should be rules <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it's 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 very strange how no, that happens. Like bombing, <laughs> they make they make the first um, you know assumption that comes to their mind and. And you know, I, I think a, a little bit of humility about you know where somebody is coming from is in order because that's what people are lacking. Like, like you know, even us, we read all these books, but we're always thirsting for more, right? We we understand that we don't. There's a lot we don't know, and we're and and you know, there's there's always much to learn. So, so um, so yeah, like like Jeremy said, I I try to uh, engage the person. You know, you you attract more more flies with honey than with vinegar, right? So <laughs> you got to speak smoothly and gently to people and just ask questions, you know, like, you know, I like, I get into, it's, it's amazing, my my brother, when I go with, uh, my brother's 23 and we go sometimes to the, to the grocery store and he's amazed that before, like I'm on the cashier line and, and the woman is checking out my groceries and by the time, like, I'm done. I I already started talking about the Federal Reserve, inflation, quantitative easing. <laughs> and, and then he, afterwards he's like, how did you do that? Like, who talks about that stuff at the cashier line? You know, <laughs> you know does but, that turn does that turn people off though, or are you actually no, getting a response I, from I that? I get people or? thinking like like I, like this one time I was so effective that um, by the end, by the time she finished ringing me up, like she was interested in my website and my blog, and I could have gotten her her email like to include me on my on my emailing list to send her <laughs> my articles. <laughs> like like you know, I'm getting pretty good at talking to people. I mean. Um, and I mean, I, I guess I've, I've never had a problem talking to people, you know, you've uh, never like, uh, said because, anything that you're like, Oh, because I shouldn't be, have said that. I'm not being a good be, steward because I'm not, I'm not really like a confrontational guy. I never, I never been like that. I always, you know, you know, my, 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 um, my, my, uh, experience in stand up comedy. Um, I think that really helped a lot with my social skills, you know, so, you know, helps cause when you make people laugh, right, you, you tear down their defenses and they feel much more comfortable with you and then you can basically say anything and they're very receptive right you're not you're not attacking them right you're not uh, putting them on the defensive and people appreciate that right so so that's what I try to do with that. so anybody I talk to you know crack jokes make them laugh and then tell them your truths <laughs> well, but what were you was there anything was there any kind of phase where you went through where you just were like Walking up to people and like just trying to cram it down their throat, and you were sensing that response that they were getting. You're like, well, why isn't this working? Were you were you cognitively examining your situations, or, or were you were you looking at things like, mm, how could have I handled that differently? Okay, or, so 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 um, when let's see, uh, maybe like starting like five years ago, I started a um, like uh, I was emailing. Um, you know, documentaries, videos that I thought that were interesting, and you know, I'd write like a paragraph or two, and I would email them out. And when I first started this thing, I included my entire family: my grandparents, my parents, my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, everybody. Right? And then, as as my writing began to be more inflammatory, right, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, how do you say, just fiery, um, 
I got, I was getting signals from my family that they weren't appreciative of what I was saying, and I was getting complaints from my family members. So, so eventually, I just decided to take all of my family off. I wiped them all off, and I only kept on anybody who actually wanted to continue, you know, listening or reading my stuff. And then, and so now it's just mainly composed of people that I talk to, engage, and then you know, if they want to hear more, then I include them on my emailing list. So, so. If anything, those are the people that I like tried to cram down <laughs> their throats. <laughs> it was my family members, um, but not really like people around. So me. Me, it, it, like you said earlier, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, those are the people you care about the most in this entire world. So you were trying to throw them that proverbial life jacket, right? They're drowning, and you're trying to throw that, and you're realizing that they don't see that they're drowning. Yeah. So you've got to find a way to coax them into seeing that, hey, you might want to grab onto this life jacket, right, Jeremy? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that, that, yeah, it takes a while to get that. Uh, at least for me, it took that while to get that balance. Uh, like I said, most uh, even to, to today, most of my family won't engage with me. Um, and if they do, it's like uh, it's only on social media, and it'll be like a little hit and run piece where they'll jump in and, and say one thing about something I've posted, and then won't respond to me when I take the time to, to write a nice, <laughs> yeah. you know, couple paragraph response to them about why I feel the way I feel and, and my reasons for it, uh, and then I don't hear back from them. You, you just hate uh, poor. Only, you, you just hate poor people, Jeremy. You just you yeah. Just, yeah. The kids. You just you just um, you just want or, everyone or want to starve, no, man. What about the kids? <laughs> Yeah, the kids, the kids fascist. Stop thinking elderly. about your own kids for once, all right? You know, you're 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 akin to Hitler. <laughs> of but uh, the only well for me, the only exception now is is my dad. I I've, I've actually gotten him on board. That uh, is really that that warms my heart. That is awesome. Well, my dad me, will not talk to me about this stuff. <laughs> well, to me, to me, it's a major accomplishment because he's actually he's the one who who inadvertently started me on this path uh, shortly after my kids were born. <laughs> and because he was so anti Obama, because he's a hardcore Tea Party constitutionalist, uh, uh, and was you know Obama's a Muslim, like he's like he's like that far, like you know like the, Kenya, the Kenya thing. Um, that's like my dad. He started. Your dad and my just, dad would be best friends. <laughs> well, he just he started he started email bombing me. Oh um, Lord. With, with all the, like he just started deciding one day he wasn't going to hold back anymore and he started bombarding me with all this stuff like read this read this read this and uh, it was right before the the, the first the first Obama election and um, you know trying anything in his power to get me to not vote for Obama <laughs> um, and I finally started this I waited like a year and then I finally decided to start listening to him and started going back and reading some of the emails and that's when I that's when my transition started from. Like like I said last week, I went from like you know the no, the the low info demo, you know the low info liberal to a little slightly more knowledgeable but basically no info Republican. <laughs> but that's what started me on the path because I went to conservatism and then I went to the Tea Party with him. And but I kept reading as you were as you were saying before about how you know voluntarists and people you know, akin to that tend to read a lot more. And I was one of those people, and I just started reading and reading and. I got to a point that I out, outpaced him at one point and started giving him stuff that he had never heard of and he had never considered. Uh, but now, after when I finally made this, when I finally uh, made the jump, uh, uh, he thought I was a little nutty. But in the past year or so, I've gotten him to the point where now he's sending me stuff and asking me questions and going, "Wow, wow!" That's, you know, he's he's actually at the once point you get someone in the question phase, isn't it so beautiful? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's well, that's the goal is to get them into the. That, wait I, a second, maybe I'm not right about this. That's where my brother's yeah. in right now. My my 23 year old brother. He's asking oh, me that's, questions like that. That's beautiful. It's, 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 it's great when you do that, and that's that. Those are the success stories. They're few and far between, but well, they, like I said, with my dad, it, 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 it's a big deal to me to get him to come around on this, and he's actually where I was towards the end because the last, he's pretty much hung up on the military, and I just recently buy him said, a copy of For a New Liberty and make him read it. Well, I, I, I did. I ordered it for his Kindle, <laughs> but I also actually, I also actually sent them multiple links to Chaos Theory. I'm like, just, just read this, just, just read this, and come back to me and tell me what I, you think. I, I got to read that one too. <laughs> I haven't read that one either, and I love Robert Murphy. He wrote, uh, but won't the world warlords take over? <laughs> but um, so how about I you, just Dave? wanted, to, I just wanted to touch on, on, on kind of my transition. You know, like I said in the last episode, I was really. 
done with politics. Kind of, my minarchist phase was about a week long, <laughs> literally. Um, uh, luckily, I just happened to listen to Four New Liberty, and that squashed everything. Um, it is the red pill, in my opinion. For for me, at least, I think that's all on an individual level. But when I first got into it and, and accepted everything and really grasped the message to some extent, not like I am now, I just wanted to tell everyone I know. I, I you know I used to flood my Facebook up like uh, somebody who's one of those Obama Muslim you know people or or you know guns are going to kill everybody people and <laughs> it, 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 and. and some of my friends really rejected that, and people I would meet, or friends I would talk to, parents, uh, and, and you can't walk up to somebody and hit them over a head with a shovel and, and expect them to say, you know what, that was a good thing to do. <laughs> and, and I feel Free like, too, yeah, that's, <laughs> I believe that's what too many people do once they first step into this uh, philosophy, and I, I'm guilty of this charge. I. I Thankfully, it didn't last long, and I've I've apologized to a lot of my friends if I've, you know, uh, been too forward or or anything. But it, you know, I tell them, look, if you have any questions or if you think I'm a crazy nut, I'm the same guy. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, th- I just don't believe that. I just believe that every human interaction should be voluntary. I mean, that's the only difference between me and you right now as a person, and that's my biggest thing now is conveying that to people. Not all this. Well, you're a sheep. Uh, you know, uh, cops are fascists. All the all, uh, no, duh, they're fascists. They work for the government. So you're stating rhetorical. You're 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 trying to use words to incite a reaction. You're trolling. You're not you're not planting seeds, and that's that's where I want to to go with this next point. Is 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 maybe talk about some of your success stories about how you've not underhandedly. But correctly conveyed the messages to help better people or help people better associate that with real human intent and not this you're not some just crazy person. You know, you're 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 really trying to give them something that you wholeheartedly believe, and this isn't a phase, this isn't some kind of flyby belief, this isn't like Somebody who's like, I'm a Pats fan. No, no, I'm a, a Raiders fan. No, no, no. This isn't a bandwagon thing. This is – you accept this and you want to tell everybody about it, but we've got to channel that in correct, uh, correctly and, and, and narrow down the message. One of the best people I've seen ever do it is Cal M- Molnet or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Uh, uh, Molnet or whatever. He, yeah. he, he has a simple message. When he's talking to people that have never heard the philosophy before and he's toned it down. He's not using big words like sophistry. He's not using words like fascist. He's not using trigger words. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hate to use that phrase because I hate it. Words are words. Um, but he's not using words to incite um, a backlash where people want to build a wall mm-hmm. and hide behind that belief. And I think we touched on that last episode as well. Is You don't want to be so aggressive that people have to defend themselves. What you want to do is get them into that questioning phase. Get them to where they're actually curious about what you believe in. Would you not agree, Danilo? Or uh, 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 and and I'm passing the torch to you to say uh, maybe you could go on and say some of the things that you've you've done to accomplish this feat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, well, well, we should probably uh, wrap it up. We're on an hour and ten minutes, but um, we'll, but we'll we'll do it after Jeremy Jeremy talks for a minute, sure. and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll say our bias. Sure, sure. So. So my my success stories, I would say, would be um, when I was working as an acupuncturist in a no fault car accident clinic. I had exposure to a lot of people, like would come in and out, you know, just uh, always with their new cases and everything. And so I I would carefully gauge a, a patient, you know, as they would be coming in, I would ca- gauge them with certain questions to determine if if their mind was open, right, and receptive to receiving this kind of stuff, because <laughs> it's dangerous if you, like, just, you know, surprise somebody with these things, you know, so I gauged people very carefully, and then once I discovered, like, this this person is interested, this person is inquisitive, right, then I, I you know, I go, in, and with me, one of my favorite ways to introduce the topics of volunteerism is to start with the monetary system, right? Because money is what we all use. Everybody's familiar with, you know, everybody uses dollar bills. But the problem is 
nobody or very few people take the time to understand what exactly is written on the dollar bill and what that signifies, right? You have <laughs> the top, it says Federal Reserve note, right? Then it says dollar bill, right? So what does that mean? What does Federal Reserve note mean? And then I go into what is the Federal Reserve? Do you know what the Federal Reserve is? And most people say, no, I have no idea. Like, like, <laughs> then I go into that. What does note? What does note mean? You have, you have any idea with that? So it's a basic, I'm educating them on that. You know, what is, you know, dollar, you know, before 19, uh, you know, before 1913, $1, um, or, or one, one, um, one dollar equals one twentieth of an ounce of gold. And they're like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> you know, so I, I, I like to educate people on economics, you know, as, or, or, you know, uh, specifically the monetary system. It's fascinating. And, and like, you know, I take, you know, like say one, one dollar, it, it takes roughly, you know, to print and with the ink and paper and then transportation, roughly six cents, right? One dollar. That's the, that's the cost to me, to me, one dollar, right? And I say, how much do you think it, it costs to print transport a uh, hundred dollar bill? And they're like, oh, I don't know. They're like seven cents. You know why? Because it's an extra zero, it's a little more ink, right? <laughs> and then they're like, what? That's it? I'm like, yeah, it's just paper. It's just paper and ink with dead with dead people on it, right? I mean, more specifically, dead, 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 dead fascists, dead mass murderers, but you know, dead people. That people have been idolizing, right? And then, and that I think that gets people jarred. Like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> so I think that's one of my. Those are good points. One of my ways that I that I use. I use the monetary system. I think that that's um, it's a neutral topic because you know when you, once you start talking about I guess um, immigration or um, you know foreign policy, people have you know they have their. Um, uh, you know they have their points, their perspectives, and, and they're biased already. But when you talk about the monetary system, like you you're gonna you're gonna be lucky if you meet one person that knows much about the Federal Reserve at all. You know, <laughs> so that's my thing. I love I love talking about the Federal Reserve. <laughs> what about you, Jeremy? Um, well, I, I didn't mean to step on your point, Dave, by telling the story about my dad early because I didn't. No, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that, your your dad's no, story. No, 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 no. It gives me it gives me hope. I, I think I should. Like, no, he's, uh, He's he's my biggest he's my biggest success story to date. Um, but basically, you know how I got to him uh, is it, it, it's the change in my attitude and the change in, in my how I was evangelizing um, overall. Just he picked up on uh, where some others had already either given up and didn't want to come back, or uh, others are still on the fence. Um, but I. You know, what I was saying before about how I was very in your face and, and, and just posting things and screaming at people and calling names. Um, you know, I do a lot of my outreach on social media just because of my business. I'm out, you know, you know, like I, I'm out walking. I think I said last week I'm out walking dogs six to ten hours a day, uh, you know, between walking and driving and, and running into people and stuff uh, or not running into people that often. So the only time I have to talk to people, even my family <laughs> or my friends is online. Uh, so I do a lot of my outreach there and I just switch, you know, I just switched it up and I, I still, I, I pick, uh, information sometimes that had less inflammatory headlines. Uh, but I also stopped, uh, I, I stopped giving my own opinion on it other than, uh, interesting read, check it out, you know, rather than t telling people you have to read this cause you're a sheep if you don't and stuff like that. Uh, and my dad actually just unbeknownst to me started reading this stuff and then he started coming to me. Um, or whenever I would talk to him, I just, instead of telling him things, I would ask him questions. And that, that's really all it is. You know, Danilo, you were saying, you know, with the monetary system. Um, my thing is I, I just try to gauge everybody and, and find, you know, I said last week, you got to find that in. Um, everybody has a different one. Uh, you know, there's something that is, is super important to one person and is not important at all to another. So if you talk to people a little bit and you find out, what they're interested in and, and what what bothers them in general, or if they just come out and say it, that's when you, you know, Jill, I think that's what you were saying before about when you're out in public. I, I think we've talked about this previously, where you just, you know, you hear that one thing and somebody starts complaining about something, and if you have some knowledge on it, that's a perfect place to just jump in and, you know, just try not to be pushy, just give an opinion or ask a question and back off a little bit and see what they say and see where they go. And, that's that's my whole thing now is I, I'm really trying to lead people to it rather than beat them over the head with it because as we've, we've already discussed, that doesn't work. Um, and in the end, that's what actually worked for me was, you know, the, the guy I spoke about last week who, who was the first one to use the term voluntarism with me. Um, 
you know, he didn't force feed me anything. He didn't try to convince me. He just always asked questions and just kind of threw stuff out there and, and see where I took it. And I, I, that, I, you know, I came to the conclusion on my own. And that's, I think that's important for everybody. So like I said, my, my dad's the, the one success I have now still working on my wife. Um, <laughs> I think she's getting, I think she's getting closer. She doesn't you're, think I'm as crazy. She doesn't think I'm as crazy. At you'll least get there. Much. At least not for this reason anymore. I think she's still thinking I'm crazy, but for different reasons. <laughs> she, she trusts. She trusted you enough to uh, father her children. So. Well, I, I didn't make. I didn't. I didn't make the change until. I didn't make the change um, until after the kids were born. So that she. Well, still, I, she, I, I she's, You're still the same person. That's this. The, yeah. the whole point of this thing is we're not well, crazies. Well, to an extent, it, it it does change you though when you start making these connections and you realize you know you, you, you can't. It, it's almost impossible not to have it change you um, in some dramatic way because it, it in a lot of cases it, it throws your world completely upside down. Oh, almost yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, yeah. Because almost you, everything you know, it's a yeah. lie. Yeah, because you're not you're not just paying taxes now, but you're supporting you know foreign occupations, um, <laughs> invasions, right? You're supporting you subjugation know, wealth, of your welfare, neighbors. subjugation of yeah. That's what you're supporting yeah. with taxes. It's, it's not just paying your taxes, sending a check, and that's it, right? You we understand yeah. where that money goes, right? Yeah. and what it's used for. So, so. Yeah, so yeah, so that's a, that's that's the point I was trying. To, that's basically what I was trying to say, though. Is just it, it has to change it to some extent. So it has, but she'll come around hopefully. At the very least, I got the kids to work with. I can try to mold them. Yeah, <laughs> they're still young enough. Hopefully, uh, they'll, they'll just be the next. They'll be the next line of defense. <laughs> um, I I don't, I don't really have a success story to talk about, but I really, I, I, I well, recently uh, one of the guys that's been working on uh, the construction uh, job I've been doing, um, I've got him completely understanding of a lot of the philosophy. Uh, gave him a copy of Freedom uh, by uh, Adam Kokesh, and he read it on his plane ride back to uh, where he lives. And uh, when he got back, because he, he had to fly home to do some stuff, and then he came back the, the, like two days later, and he was telling me, you know, he got about halfway through the book, and he is really seeing some eye-opening stuff, like stuff he's never thought of. And, you know, I just got him into the question phase, you know, very easily and very nonchalantly, you know, we were talking and, you know, he was, uh, he's from Colorado and he was, you know, wor he's working in, in Alabama and, you know, he said, I think it's ridiculous that weed's not legal here. And, you know, I just said, well, why do you think it's ridiculous? You know, and I just built upon that, you know, I was like, well, you know, I don't really think that any government command is legitimate. And here's why. And he like, it was like a, it was like a screwdriver tightening his head. He was like, what? And then he was like, holy shit, I agree with everything you just said. And then we talked about cops. We talked about this. We talked about public parks. We talked about all of this for hours um, while we were, you know, had stuff to wait on, you know, pe waiting on people to do, uh, get us stuff, uh, you know, just talking. But uh, another, uh, I got somebody to completely stop dead in their tracks the other day on Twitter. I, I post about it in the group. Um, and they messaged, they DM'd me. I don't want to say who it was. Um, I don't want to put them on blast or anything, but they DM'd me this this individual, and um, they because uh, apparently I guess they didn't want to publicly say it, but you know I we were talking back and forth, and then boom, he just I, he contradicted himself, and I called him on it, and I just very nicely called him on it. I didn't be like, well, don't you see you're a fucking idiot? Like I I I, I said, well, you know how am I not right in this situation? And he just, he didn't say anything after that. And like a day later, he was like, Hey, do you have any literature I can read to better understand your point? And nice. like, I, I did a little dance. I thought he was going to block me and, and move <laughs> on and, and continue with his day and push me off as an afterthought. Yeah. And you know, I, I just said, look, how much time do you have to read? And he, he, not a lot. And I said, well, check out this audio book. If you got time, listen to it while you work out. And uh, I'm waiting on him to say something back. But, uh, you know, the biggest thing you can do, guys, is not push people. Just plant the seed and walk away. If the, if the plant doesn't grow, oh, well. Mm -hmm. But you're going to get more success trying to – if you – you're not going to burn someone's ideal ca – idea castles down with fire. They're made of stone. They've been in there their whole life. 
They've been built upon lies, built upon lies, lies built upon lies. All the way up, you're not going to burn that down. You have to show them why they're wrong in the nicest way possible. You almost have to be a salesman. Um, and that's that's one of my biggest successes is just getting people to realize, wait a second, I might be wrong here. And that's very hard to get people to do is to admit that you're wrong because no one wants to do it. You know what I'm saying? If I told you you were wrong about that soul patch, you'd probably fucking go crazy. You, you would defend <laughs> it to the death. That's but it. You're not wrong about it because it's fantabulous. <laughs> so, but you, you see what I'm saying? Like, there's two ways to, to, to scramble an egg here, you know? And one way's the, the preferable way, and one way's the uh, rush job. And you can't rush things like completely changing an ideology that's been beaten into someone's head their whole life. And you always have to keep into consideration how you became a liberty. Uh, uh, supporter, how you became an advocate of individual, I, I hate to say the word, individual anarchy. And, and you have to realize that not everyone is going to, you know, chop a tree down the same way. You have to find out what worked for you, refine that, and translate it. That's it. Translate it into what they're going to be able to accept. And uh, if we want to close down, is there any any tips, like straight out, just flat out thing that you would want to say if you had someone, like if you could pick somebody, especially in our groups, that is, um, don't say their name, but if you wanted to pick someone and just say, hey, try this instead of that. Try try a different method instead of, you know, what what's the saying? Insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. You know, what would what would you... What advice would you give to someone, uh, stranger A will say, what would you say to stranger A that's doing what you have seen fail in the past, Jeremy? Um, well, that, that would really just be going over my points again. <laughs> no, no, no. Like what, what it's something no, no, it's quick. Really, it's really, it's really, I was just going to say, it's really, that, that's, that's simply, you know, the, the best advice I could personally give is just is, is ask questions instead. And, and oh, never, you know, even if you have to respond to a question with a question sometimes just to get the ball rolling. Um, but as far as like the overall advice for this particular topic, uh, the, the biggest thing to me that I, you know, to kind of echo what you were saying uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, just plant, planting the seeds. Uh, my, my thing now is when I do engage on social media, uh, especially because, like I said, you have you have a bigger audience there than, than you're going to get in person most of the time, unless somebody's paying you for a speaking engagement, which I, I don't think any of us are currently uh, scheduled getting. debates <laughs> in public. I, I, I don't think we're getting any offers at the moment. So, so places like social media are the, are the best app we have for things like this. Uh, but the one thing that I, I I've learned is that it's it's almost never the person you're talking to or or typing to or, or, or whatever the medium you're using. Uh, that's the most important. And that's how I try to treat most people. If I decide to engage in a, in a debate on some page or, or in some group, um, or even if somebody comes onto my wall and decides to, uh, to, to start at, you know, saying something, or even, even if they're being derogatory, um, I'll, I'll try to engage them. And a lot of the times, if I keep going, they, they'll think they're winning. Uh, but I'm only, I'm not, I'm not, interested in trying contest. to convert that. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm, well, I'm not interested in trying to convert them. You know, nine times out of 10, my target audience is the people that I know. And I've learned this actually because a couple of my family members have actually finally come up to me and told me that they don't comment on anything that I post, but they read everything. So my, my target audience is the people that I know I are out friends like that too. reading silently and not saying anything. So I try to keep my cool in all situations, you know, in, in almost all situations. Uh, and, and just continue to keep dropping the logical points and asking questions. And it's, it's, I, I actually look forward to when people go a little crazy and start throwing around the ad hums and stuff like that because it just makes it easier to make my point. Uh, you know, so that's, for, I guess that would be the second point is just is don't engage in those silly battles. You know, the, the ad hum wars that go on and stuff like that, whether it's in person or, or, or on the computer or whatever. It, it's not worth it. It's just you're most of the time you're giving the person, the other person what they want. Uh, 
uh, and and it's not you just end up looking badly, especially if there's a crowd again, whether it's a cyber crowd or or a real crowd, uh, you, you end up making yourself look worse in that situation. So, so you're saying like politely dig that hole and let them bury or hand them the shovel and let them bury themselves essentially, like yeah. Like that's that's a good way to look at it, you know. Like, well, it's, yeah, put, put, let them put themselves on display, and all you're doing is pointing out that you have contradictions here and you don't realize them. So, but so someone it. reading it that's not in that furious back and forth might say, "Jeremy's blowing this out. Like he is completely right about all this, and this guy's burying himself. He looks like an idiot because it's hard to realize that you're advocating violence when that's what you've taught been taught is right your whole life." Yeah, no, exactly. And I've, I've had people come to me a couple of days after the fact that for some of those things and, and actually have said to me, yeah, I know I read that and I, I totally see what you're saying. I've actually had the people that were flipping out on me and on one or two occasions come back a couple of days later and then want to ask questions because they calmed down <laughs> and went back and read the whole thing and was like, and were like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> they, they actually started checking their premises. So, uh, so yeah, that, like I said, never... Don't don't think anything you're doing is a waste. You know, that there's always another audience out there that you don't really that you don't really pay attention to. That, uh, oh yeah, you that never know who's could, watching. Could be learning if you're just dropping the seeds and, and and trying to move on. So Danilo, what are some of your hot tips? What's Danilo's? What's Mister Quayar's hot tips for for gaining more advocates of liberty? All right, so I guess I'll I'll finish up uh, this episode with. Uh, well, first of all, um, a quote from Socrates, uh, he, he said, the, the first person to engage in insults lost the debate, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because, oh, correct. Yeah. Because that's an act of desperation, right? You have no more logical arguments at your disposal, so then you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're a sexist, you're, you hate the poor, whatever it is, right? Right. It's, <laughs> it, it, yeah. it's just name-calling at that point, and, and, and the conversation is over, basically. But um, I think, I think the, um, the seeds analogy is really a wonderful analogy because, you know, if you think about plants and seeds, like, you can't force a plant to grow, <laughs> right, right. You have to provide. Grow, damn you! Grow. <laughs> you have to provide the you know the perfect surroundings for yet yeah, you know the perfect ratio of surroundings. You know, too much water it drowns. Too little it die. You know, it, it desiccates. Right. So, so there has to be the perfect ratio, and um, and I think it's similarly, you know, you know, same thing with you know public education. Right. You, you can't force a child to learn something. Right. Um, they're going to either want to learn it or. We're not learned it, <laughs> and you can't force it either way. Um, so, and you can't call that education either. That's why it's, that's why it's called indoctrination. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the, it's it's you know very true what you said, Jeremy. That uh, you know when, when you debate with people online, especially you know you do it not so much for the person, but for the people watching. And that's that's the true value is um, is other people because you really never know where your influence will lead you know and that's why i love posting stuff on youtube because you know you have no idea who's watching your stuff on youtube right mm -hmm. um so that's what really is awesome you know youtube has, has done so much i mean the internet in general but youtube has done so much to just spread ideas lightning fast like and it's so funny when i hear people say um <laughs> like you know, you shouldn't. You've been watching. You've been looking at the internet too much. Don't don't believe everything you see on the internet. Like, so does that mean that you believe everything you see on TV? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, like that doesn't that doesn't make sense. Like, of course, there's going to be people you know uh, espousing different perspectives, and that's great. That's wonderful, right? It's called the free market. It's called where people, you know, ideas are are um, you know thrown around all over the place, and that means that you have to critically analyze and think and research and not believe. Um, you know, at the first reading, right? You have to do your own research, and it's not a substitute for thinking, for critical thought, right? So, so yeah, the internet has just been a savior, and I think is is catapulting uh, the uh, the uh, intelligence of humanity and and helping us to realize that much quicker the uh, illegitimacy of government and the state. So. So I think uh, that would wrap it up for this episode of Seeds of Liberty podcast. Thank you very much for watching. This is um, Danilo from Peace Finicism, Dave, and Plant Jer Seeds. And Don't Jeremy. start fires. <laughs> Plant Seeds and read Rothbard, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. As always. Read. <laughs> That's Re read. Or just read. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. So um, we'll continue this hopefully next week. Take care. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Peace.